The Heifetz student we'll meet this evening is the American violinist Eric Friedman. He began his career very much in the Heifetz style and teaches now at Yale University. I like to say he played the violin from a technical point of view like he played ping pong with complete objectivity. And uh, he made a fetish of saying things uh, le bon mot, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the shortest possible way. For example, I was playing for him one day, and he stops me, and he looks at me, and again, those uh, eyes penetrate, his eyes open. He said, you know, when I think I'm playing out of tune, I usually am. <laughs> <laughs> Which was Spanish for your playing out of tune, right? <laughs> exactly. I got the point very quickly. <laughs> and he was a very well-trained musician. You know, it's a little different. Uh, it's an era that, uh, that in many ways doesn't exist anymore in terms of the kind of training that he had at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And uh, of have solfege and piano and, and other instruments and viola. And, uh, and uh, he was just a, a, an all-around musician. He just knew what he was doing. What did he teach you? He taught me, first of all, he taught me uh, the, the, the absolute honest approach to playing the violin. There, it's hard, uh, you know, just a radio interview to, to kind of really touch upon the genius of Yasha Heifetz, which really transcended his, his an, uh, enormous musical sensitivity and also athletic ability. Because he was a very athletic, and playing the violin to a great extent is just translating... Uh, you know uh, Michael Jordan's ability to jump to the to 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 the fingers, and uh, he had the, this uh, this enormous athletic ability, and he played ping pong the same way, he played tennis the same way, swam, you know he was just an athlete, but he also uh, understood from his from his um, his life experiences with his own teachers, namely Auer. He was enormously attached to Auer, Leopold Auer. And in order to really understand uh, Heifetz, one has to uh, understand Auer and Auer's relationship to Vinyavsky and Vinyavsky's relationship to Viotti and even to the French Revolution, you know, the, the, uh, the Paris Conservatoire that we, th you know, we think of the French Revolution as a lot of rolling heads. But, the, uh, but really what went on there was a, uh, was a very concerted effort by the Revolutionary Committee and the revolutionary leaders at that time to bring education to the masses, not just to royalty, not just to members of... Uh, you know, the elite class. And one of them was to engage great violinists from Italy, namely Viatti and people like this, you know, to, to, to bring a school of violin playing. Now, there's a whole providence, there's a whole um, a lineage of violinists that uh, began to have a certain way of playing for larger and larger audiences. Um, for example, Vinyavsky, who was the first violinist to come to the United States and play in, in hippodromes and railroad stations because, you know, so many people wanted to hear him. They couldn't just play in a small auditorium, an opera, a small opera house, you know, or a, or a church or a, or a cathedral. And uh, he developed a style of playing that, uh, that was commensurate with uh, making the violin sound larger and richer, at the same time not sacrificing the quality of the sound and intonation. You know, that's a very windy way of putting it, but uh, I, I don't know how else to say it. Now, this is why, you know, uh, this is w one of the interesting things that, uh, from a historical point of view, why Heifetz's teacher, Auer, had the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto dedicated to him. Many people don't think about that. Here was this, this great, uh, revered Russian composer who dedicates his, his only violin concerto that he writes to a rather obscure concert violinist who mainly taught. And the reason was his attachment to Vinyavsky as opposed to the, uh, the Joachim school, which was a rather stonato without vibrato. Mm. But the vibrato itself is, is, a, is, a, is a very misunderstood kind of a, uh, um, an apparatus, you know, in terms of emotional projection for, for a violinist, because the cousin to the, uh, the violin is really the voice. You know, and yep. the and the element of how one vibrates, and the use of the uh, the the way the way the, not only the frequency is varied, but the amplitude is varied. The only way, the only th the analogy I can think of is the way how vibrato has become a device to make music, and it's really not a device at all to make any music. It's a device to protect the bow. It's the bow that makes music. And that's the main difference between the violinists that uh, it's why people listen to Yasha Heifetz and they say, I always know Heifetz, but in other violinists, they, they don't know because of that unique approach that was very 
I worry and I suppose is you know to coin a word. Yeah. And uh, and this is what Heifetz was able to give me, what's it, to show me that was that was so meaningful to me. Now, do your students understand? Your students understand this line back through Heifetz, you Heifetz, and our. Some of them do. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not a shrinking violet. I tell them about it, but it you know it, it's so uh, it, they live in a different era now. You know, they live in an era of recording, and recording. Heifetz used to call it high fooey. <laughs> <laughs> he was high fooey uh, high fooey because he knew how much of it was just engineering yeah uh, that these violinists that would sound like houses but they actually would have a little meager sound and nothing mm. projective and nothing emotionally projective especially in the hall yeah so there you were at the end of three years as a student and he invited you to record with him not just to play with him but to record yes it was the bach double concerto am i right that's right tell me about that experience that experience was unbelievable and, uh, of course, I had such fear of seeing that little red, uh, red light go on. And my first recording that I was making, actually, I knew for public consumption. I had made some recordings for us. I had had a conflict with them for a number of years. But nothing had ever been released. I didn't have enough of a reputation. And uh, so you can imagine the strain I was under for the first take, whether, I'd, uh, whether they'd run me out of town, you know. I was afraid my bow might not stay on the, st- stay on the, on the string. But I made a whistle, a wolf, it's called, and, and the trade is a wolf, you know. This tremendous whistle uh, in uh, some place in one of the passages that happens, you know, violinist, you probably hear it very often yourself. Yeah, you're sure. Yeah. And, I, of course, I blew it up all out of proportion in my own mind. I thought I had let him down that I actually made this noise, you know, during one of the takes. And I'm sitting at, uh, uh, we go to the control room to listen to that first playback, to, to listen to balance, you know, that he has to approve that, and et cetera. And I'm sitting, waiting, my little by little, my head's disappearing in my shoulders, you know, <laughs> waiting for that to come. And sure enough, this tremendous whistle comes out. And I looked at him and I said, oh, Mr. Hervitz, I'm sorry, I, I lost my head there for a moment. He looks at me, he says, what, what? I said, I lost my He said, you didn't do that, I did. Really? And I looked at him, I said, well, I appreciate your efforts on my <laughs> behalf, but the fact of the matter is, is that I did that. He says, you did not. I said, I did. He said, so he goes through the whole rigmarole of asking the uh, the engineer, Eric, go back uh, one minute, put it with the um, the track with the second violin in, in predominance. And so we listen. And of course, you could almost get blown out of the room. When, <laughs> and then he said, now put it with the first violin. It does. And of course, it's a uh, little meek, little, the, the very light. And he looks at me, he looks at he says, you'll see, I told you, I did that. Yeah. And to this day, I don't know whether he was kidding, whether he really thought, you see, because what he wanted, wanted to do was protect me. He knew how I was affected. Yeah, such generosity. That's the way he was. Yeah. But he didn't say anything. That's what the, 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 he didn't say a word. In fact, I was so convinced that he was disappointed that I said to him before he left in, uh, London in the, the limousine to the airport, I said uh, to his wife, I said, uh, you know, Mrs. Heifetz, if he's unhappy, please just don't pass it. I understand that the honor and privilege of standing next to him is enough for me. She said, no, he thought it was quite good. He said it was like recording with himself. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best of all compliments. <laughs> I'll tell you, that, that really floored me.